Every filmmaker is different. Most stay fairly consistent stylistically throughout their careers, but great directors take their style one step further, using their movies as a medium to convey their personal thoughts, values, and beliefs. One filmmaker who consistently put forth his viewpoints and thoughts through his films was the Swedish filmmaker Ingmar Bergman. Every time a Bergman film came out, which was very frequent, you knew that there was another level you had to reach to with him, where he was going to take you. He may leave you behind a little, <laughs> a lot maybe, but you knew that there was something special that you were going to see. Through three consecutive films of the early 1960s, Bergman wrestles with his own religious demons. In this video, we will examine these three films in depth, as well as a few other Bergman masterpieces made before and after this spiritual trilogy, through which he explores his views on God. But before we start with the video, this is your spoiler alert. In his earliest years, Bergman experimented with a few different types of films, most of which center on doomed romances. The interpersonal struggles between couples of these early films prelude the spiritual conflicts of Bergman's later characters, so it's important to analyze such hopeless love affairs. In 1951's Summer Interlude, a lonely ballerina dancer named Marie recalls her first love when she was 13 years younger. As a teenager, Marie is on summer vacation where she meets Henrik. The two spark immediately, and the rest of the summer is filled with love and laughter. The conflict arises when the relationship is strained as Marie and Henrik become too preoccupied with their hobbies and aren't finding enough time for each other. We're led to believe the affair will end here, but to our delight, the young couple works through their problems and the two become happy together once again. However, just when things are at their greatest point, Henrik suffers a fatal injury attempting to dive in the ocean off a rock face. After his death, Marie is stricken with grief, and in the most powerful scene of the film, she stares out a window, speaking of her contempt for God. Here, in this heartbreaking sequence, we are subject to a common theme of Bergman's, his interpretation of how death affects relationships with the Lord. Throughout the film, Bergman uses clever motifs to subtly remind us that death is always imminent. The most prominent of these is the poor old woman dressed in black. Through the old woman, Marie is reminded of mortality, yet the death of Henrik sends her into a blasphemous rant about her hatred for God. Bergman wants us to know of the constant struggle between God and death, and how hard it is to remain true to the former when the latter takes hold. Though relatively subtle in summer interlude, Bergman pushes this spiritual battle to the forefront in his 1957 classic, The Seventh Seal. Considered by many to be his greatest film, the Seventh Seal focuses on a knight named Antonius Block, who returns from the Crusades to find Europe devastated by the Black Plague. When Death, a harrowing figure cloaked all in black, appears to take Block, the knight challenges him to a game of chess. Should Block win, he gets to live, but if he loses, he dies, to which Death gladly accepts. The chess match serves as the backdrop of the film. Block meets an array of different characters throughout the movie. These secondary characters are also potential victims of the plague, and by offering them his companionship, the knight Block binds them to his fate. The seventh seal continues the religious conflict hinted in Summer Interlude, while adding higher stakes for its main character. As a knight of the Crusades, Antonius Block does not view God as merely a part of his life, but his entire earthly purpose. Therefore, should death went out over the Lord, it would discredit any meaning in Bloch's existence. Not only does the knight fight death with chess pieces, but he seeks confirmation of the existence of God. If death can show himself so easily, 
Why can't Block's Almighty Father prove his own existence? This is the central question of the seventh seal. Antonius Block's personal fight with God versus death is also his quest for meaning in his life. The seventh seal is important in the evolution of Ingmar Bergman's filmography for many reasons. Primarily, it's the first to address God's silence. For Block, God is silent and absent. He cannot be seen, he does not talk. There is something literal about the knight's need to grasp God with the senses. His wish is never granted. A morbid thought, yes, but the film does not necessarily follow that ominous notion all the way to the final frame. Though this inner quest for a literal confirmation of the Lord's existence fails, the frustrated knight still believes he can reach salvation should he save just one of his followers from a gruesome death courtesy of the plague. Towards the end of the movie, he distracts death by accidentally knocking pieces off the chessboard, while a few of the travelers Block was with are allowed to escape. On the next move, death wins the game solidifying the fates of Block and the rest of his crew. However, despite Death's earlier claim that no one escapes me, the young family following Block did in fact get away. In this way, Block finds redemption. He sacrifices himself and multiple others in order to save the lives of people he thought important enough to live on. This 1957 treasure acts as a sort of prequel to the before-mentioned trilogy that Bergman made later in his career at the end of which the director essentially makes the statement that he has given up believing. If I am good or not good, if I am uh, a bad uh, uh, in comparison to Christ or to God, if I am a bad person, it, it has no, it's not important. The only importance is uh, other people. Those three films deal with love, doubt, and then silence in that order. But with the ending of The Seventh Seal, Bergman tells us that the fight for meaning and belief is far from over. Through a Glass Darkly is the first of our three main films. It features only four characters throughout the entirety of the movie. A troubled young woman suffering from schizophrenia, her equally troubled husband, her novelist father, and her younger brother. Over a 24-hour period on a secluded vacation island, the declining mental health of the woman, Karen, greatly impacts the lives of the three men who most strongly care for her. We learn that Karen is plagued by visions of a group of people waiting in a large room with one door. We're told that someone is coming to see them, and that it may be God himself. She tells only her brother of this dream, and he becomes deeply concerned for her. Around the same time, Karen's father David tells her husband Martin of his own suicide attempt while on holiday in Switzerland. David explains that he was suddenly overcome with a burning love for his family. God saved David's spirit by filling him with love. It is made very clear, however, that this is the only form that God will present himself in. When the end of Karen's vision is finally revealed, it is not God who walks through the door to greet all the people, but rather a giant spider that sexually assaults her. Though Karen is almost completely out of her mind at this point, her hallucination combined with David's revelation does suggest that God cannot take human form, but is closely linked to feelings of love. This is confirmed by the final scene of the film, in which David tells his son what he believes to be proof of God's existence. I can give an answer to my own hope. The idea of that love exists as something that is really in the world's world. He goes on to question whether love is proof of God's existence or if it's God himself. However touching this may be, the notion that the director has accepted the Lord in this manner could not be further from the truth. Ingmar Bergman absolutely hated the way the end of Through a Glass Darkly was perceived. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. He despised the idea that God is love and set out on a new venture to correct this improper reflection of his own belief. With Winter Light, Bergman puts a struggling priest in the spotlight. Coincidentally, the priest is played by the same actor as David from the previous film. This casting choice helps the audience with the reconsideration of the words spoken at the end of Through a Glass Darkly. The priest, Thomas, has all but lost his faith after the death of his wife. His daily routine has become an empty, monotonous affair. Going all the way back to summer interlude, Bergman once again brings up the theme that death causes the severest contempt for God. Thomas does not denounce the Lord quite as directly as Marie, 
but he is sent into a spiraling web of doubt nonetheless. No one around him makes him feel any better, and like Antonius Block, Thomas struggles to find any more meaning in his life. However, unlike the knight, Thomas does not have any ambition to redeem himself. When a depressed churchgoer comes to the lonely priest for help, Thomas essentially talks the man into suicide by offering him such poor spiritual advice. On this all, I'd give it into fence. But you're to feel not. Leave it pretty big it. Winter Light is an extremely cold and empty film for a reason. Bergman wants us to know of God's absence. He wants us to look back at Through a Glass Darkly and consider that David's rants about love and God are just the absurdity of an aging author, and that perhaps the real God is in fact the grotesque spider in Karen's dream. The character of Marta in Winter Light only backs up these new, troubling notions. She loves Thomas and feels it is her responsibility to ease his troubles. He plays along mostly, not wanting to be rude or overly cynical. However, after the suicide of the man in his congregation, Thomas doesn't seem to care anymore. He unloads on Marta, insulting her in a variety of extremely rude manners. Despite this, she clings on to him. For her, perhaps the God is love idea is still in play. Because of her affection for Thomas, she refused to let him go, although he has been unflinchingly cruel to her. Thomas, however, has completely given up on himself. Like most other Bergman movies, the final scene is pivotal. The priest stands in front of an empty church to give mass. His lines can be interpreted one of two ways. Given what has happened, a much-loved father and husband has killed himself, and Thomas has behaved appallingly towards Marta. The closing lines seem deeply ironic. Where is the glory of which Thomas speaks? Yet on the other hand, the new expression on Thomas' face might appear to announce that now, and for the first time, he actually believes what he's saying. Given the even darker themes of the final film in the trilogy, it's probable that Bergman wants us to believe that the so-called glory is gone and Thomas' words are as empty as his church. Unlike many of his other works, the silence does not take place on an island, but rather in what appears to be a European city. The three main characters, two sisters and a young boy, are holed up in an eerie hotel while one of the sisters has fallen ill. Besides the obviousness of the type of silence the title refers to, Bergman has created an alternate world in this film without specifically revealing the details of this fictional society. Parlez-vous français? Do you speak English? However, given that The Silence is the closing installment of a series of films about declining spiritual value, it would be safe to assume that the movie is not a window into a society praising the Almighty. Now that God is completely out of the question, Bergman uses the character of Johann to illustrate the difficulties of living in such a forsaken society. The two sisters in the silence, Esther and Anna, are very different people. Esther is the bookworm, whereas Anna is much more liberated. She desires adventure and sex as most women do, but is held down by Esther's introverted behavior because of her sickness. This causes Anna to despise Esther, feeling as though she is bound to her ill, helpless sister. The most important character, though, is the young boy, Johan. It appears the two women are the only caregivers for the boy, meaning that their actions are the greatest influence over him. It's unknown whether he will follow in the footsteps of his aunt or his mother, so he seeks answers outside of the hotel room. The ominous halls of this quiet inn mirror the outside world. Johann's experiences in these corridors will sway his social construct towards one of his two caretakers. During his adventures, Johann is subjected to numerous oddball encounters. On several occasions, a very creepy servant man attempts to seduce Johann, but he does not indulge. He runs into a band of dwarves on several occasions as they prance down the hallways. He also sees his mother engage in sexual activities, which upsets him. Because of the absence of God, 
he has nothing but his caretaker's teachings to fall back on for reasons behind these strange occurrences. Johann's struggle to grasp onto any meaning is a metaphor for the chaotic atmosphere of a godless world. Once again, we find that the most meaningful scene of the picture comes at the very end. Anna and Johann leave Esther to die in the hotel. On the train home, Johann ponders over a small translation given to him by his aunt. It simply spells out three words, spirit, joy, and anxiety. In a godless world, these three items are exactly what is missing. There is no spirit, for the Lord doesn't exist. There is no joy, for the voids between and inside human beings is empty, which Anna discovers in her meaningless sexual encounters. However, most importantly, there is no anxiety. The constant worry experienced so severely by Antonius Bloch regarding the existence of God is stripped away from the cold, lifeless world created in the silence. Mijn vader dook. Ze zouden nu willen jij te leven langer. Wat voor leven doe je het leven? Another Bergman film that simply picks up where the silence left off is Persona, which acts as another episode in a godless world. Bergman wants us to experience the frightening universe he has created in Persona and makes a statement about how even the most optimistic people will fall victim to the harrowing silence. Even though his larger religious quandary stopped after the silence, the director began crafting movies in color about a wide range of other topics, all the way up to his death in 2007. Doubt weaves its way in and out of almost every Bergman piece, making all of his movies essential for anyone who appreciates cinema in the slightest. <laughs>